study series. Today we do the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And it's an incredible study. Uh, we don't do it with everybody, but uh, we definitely do it with folks who have a uh, charismatic or Pentecostal background. Uh, you got to do the study with them because they'll begin to see from the scriptures, you know, what the Holy Spirit is all about and how he works uh, powerfully uh, today. Next week, we're going to it's going to be the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that is going to be done by none other than our brother Jeff Fisher. Amen. Yeah. Uh, Jeff's going to preach the word next week for us, which I'm really, really excited about. Uh, we're going to have an incredible time. But uh, I think both Jeff and Steve did an amazing job with yeah. their contributions. Yeah. And these are the kind of people that we have in this church. Amen. These are the kind of people who love God, who love the kingdom of God, who sacrifice the Nelsons. I mean, thank you guys so much for your incredible presentation. I mean, that was just really special. I mean, this is the kind of love we get in the kingdom of God. Amen. And I think all of us want everybody to share this love. Yes. We want them to share what we have. Yeah. So we've got to be out there teaching and preaching and, and sharing with everybody who listen. Uh, on April the 1st, that's uh, Easter Sunday. Yes. That's going to be a Bring Your Neighbor Day Sunday. Okay, okay so what does that mean? We're going to go Neighbor. for it and get as many people as possible. You know some people, all they do is go to Easter Sunday, right? Okay. That's what they going to go to church some. Get them on out here. Yeah. Right? Get, get the Christers out here. Right? <laughs> Folks who go to go to church on Christmas and Easter, right? The Christers. <laughs> get them out here. Because what, what they do is they'll hear the word of God. They'll see you. They'll have a great lunch. They'll, you know, I mean... It, Believe me, I want to share you guys with everybody. Don't you want to share your family with everybody? Yeah. Yes. I, mean, I praise God for Facebook. We can share with a whole lot of people. But I want people to be here. I'm right. talking to you and to go face to face with you and, and to fellowship with you and to learn what you're learning. You know, I hope and I pray that we all feel that way. Amen. And we get ourselves ready for an amazing uh, Bring Your Neighbor Day Easter Sunday. Uh, about a month after that, in May, we're going to have a Harvest Sunday. Woo! So all the people that we bring out to Easter Sunday and today and, and all the days we bring people out, uh, we're going we're to go for a huge huge, huge Harvest Sunday, which we get several baptisms uh, on that day. I believe it's uh, May the 6th, but I want every Bible talk yeah. to be baptizing somebody that's Come on, bro. Right. Right. Every Bible talk. Who am I Bible talking to? Raise your hand. Hello. Okay, guys, be ready. We're going to baptize. We have a few baptisms that day, which is going to be awesome. Uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit. Uh, once again, you want to make sure you do this study uh, with those who have a charismatic or Pentecostal background. What does that mean? The whole concept of speaking in tongues, uh, claiming miracles uh, or, or healing at the hands of leaders or specially gifted people, uh, being slain in the spirit, uh, people who catch the Holy Ghost, you know, different things like these are phraseologies that we've all been, uh, you know, exposed to, whether you're studying the Bible with somebody or you've been from that background. You know, I, I grew up going to Calvary Chapel, you know, and we would get together, we'd pray to receive the Holy Spirit in the tongues and, 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 and speak in tongues and stuff like that. And, and here's the reality. My, my experience was sincere. Mm -hmm. Maybe you had an experience like that. Yeah. But we were sincere. We, we, we were really trying to reach God. Yeah. And so when somebody has that background and they're trying to share that with you, the primary thing is not to tell them that their experiences weren't real or weren't valid. That, 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 that's, that's dumb. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. What they experienced, they experienced. What they've been through, they've been through. You've got to accept that and say, that's what they've been through. Let them share with you. Be quick to listen, the Bible says, oh, right? Yes. And slow to speak, yes. you know? And, 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 and so their, 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 their experience so often is valid, but one thing is always missing. It's all, and not just from charismatic and, and, and Pentecostal. One thing is usually missing from every church, discipleship. And discipleship according to the scriptures, not discipleship as a word that's used, you know, generally, but discipleship according to the scriptures. In other words, people involved in your life. See, in America, we love our privacy. The reality is it's not we love our privacy. We love our secrecy. That's what we love in America. We love our secrecy. We don't want anybody to know what's really going on. We say we love our privacy, but we love our secrecy so we can stay in our sin. And this is why so many of our lives are so messed up. It's like, man... You, we, we don't get the help we need. We don't get the confession that we need. We don't get the discipleship that we need. See, discipleship means people being in your life. Yeah. Loving you enough to tell you the truth. Yeah. I mean, how, you know, were you ever challenged before, anywhere, before you came into the kingdom of God? I mean, goodness gracious, you know. Here's where we, where we face challenges because we, we get people who love us enough to say, hey, bro. You're in sin. Right. Bro, that was really sinful. Bro, you were really prideful right there. Oh, boy. Sister, I think you were really being impatient. 
We look at that in this world and we're like, how oh, did you say such a thing? Don't judge me. Don't judge me, bro. You know what? I'm not, I'm not judging you in the sense of condemning you. I'm evaluating what you just did. And, I, and I, I'm asking you about it, bro, because I care about you. Because at the end of the day, when you're judged, that judgment is final. And when we are judged by God, that judgment is final. That's why the Bible says, admonish and teach and proclaim the word of God to each other. That's why we, we correct, rebuke, and encourage. We do that because we're preparing our hearts for judgment day. Amen? That's why we're in each other's lives. Have you had anybody in your life lately? When's the last time you confessed your sin? We don't confess our sins as Americans because we love our privacy. We love our secrecy. We've got to have people in our lives so we can, we can confess our, our, our sin to. Yeah. The Bible teaches that. Yeah. But if you don't read the Bible, you won't know. <laughs> Amen? Amen. So let's please, let's get discipleship into the lives of, uh, of people, whatever their background is. You know? And, and, and uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the whole concept of the baptism with the Holy Spirit study, you got to have, well, let's look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4, whenever you do any study with anybody, you got to have this. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, love is what? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not what? Proud. Proud. It's humble. Okay? You gotta be patient. Okay? And we gotta listen. Sometimes we gotta keep our mouths closed. So we can listen. Somebody told me, you know, we have two ears and a mouth because we're supposed to listen more than we talk. You know? And especially if you're a young Christian or a young leader, you, the more humble you are as a young leader, or even as an old leader, really, the more you will learn and grow and win the hearts of those you lead. Yeah. You gotta be humble. When they see you being humble, they're going to want to be humble. When they see you being prideful, guess what they're going to want to be? <laughs> Goodness gracious, you know. And, and, and so often, let them tell you their story. Let them tell you their experience, what they've gone through. And be like Mary, the mother of Jesus. When she heard all these things about Jesus, you know what the Bible says in Luke 2, verse 19? Yeah. It says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Yeah. See, when you listen, you, you think about what they're saying. And you ponder them in your heart so you can pray about them later. Yeah. we got to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Amen? Yeah. You want to go to heaven? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like Mary. <laughs> I ain't even Catholic. And you got to be like Mary if you want to go to heaven. She had a pure heart. You know? Um, we, 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 what, with the other things, we want to make sure we never question the sincerity of somebody's religious experience. Okay? Because that's a real thing to them. They really went through what they went through. And you got to listen patiently. And loving them, you know. You never question the sincerity of a spiritual occurrence in a person's life. Because that's part of their life. Yes. Matter of fact, guys, it's part of their spiritual journey up into meeting you. Yes. You are the next part of their spiritual journey. Because you're going to teach them discipleship. Yes. They brought God, God brought them to you. Now be wise. Yes. And be quick to listen. <coughs> and slow to speak. So often people's perceptions are real. Yeah. You know, to them. I mean, we're, we're the same way, aren't we, disciples? Yeah. Yeah. Like, our perceptions are real to us. You know, I got together with a couple of brothers this week, and it's amazing how their perceptions were completely different regarding the same incident. Oh, wow. The same exact incident. They had completely polar opposite perspectives. And guess what? They were both right. Wow. How can they both be right? Because that's their perspective. Yeah. That's what they're going through. We just got to go for God for wisdom yeah. and humility right. to come to the truth that God wants us all to come through to. Right. So we can have perfect unity. Amen. Oh, yeah. God will reveal it. Why? Because both these brothers love God. Yeah. And both of them love each other. Yeah. Even though they didn't seem like it at the time. But they love each other. <laughs> you know, we all do. I mean, think of my husbands and wives. Yeah. We love each other. Yeah. Sometimes we don't feel like it. Oh. Sometimes in 25 years you go through some yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know? 
I'm telling you, only the Lord gets us in what we want. Only the Lord. My heart goes out. My heart goes out to Donald Trump Jr. Him and his wife Vanessa been breaking up after 12 years. That, that breaks my heart because I look at them and say, I'd be the same. I'd be in the same spot if I didn't have God in my life and people of God in my life. If I didn't have friends in my life to love me and care about me through the power of the Holy Spirit to really help me in my marriage, I'd be in the same spot. So many people, I'm telling you, they get married in church and they never go back. Wow. They get married in the church, but they never go back. And then they wonder why they don't last 5, 12, they don't last more than that many years. Yeah. None of us would That's if right. folks weren't in our lives helping us grow up. Amen. Helping us grow up spiritually. Amen? Amen? So one of the questions I ask when we go into the baptism with the Holy Spirit study is this question. Hey, how did you become a Christian and why? You always want to ask that question. You always want to ask about a person's spiritual journey. Don't assume anything, but ask them, how did you become a Christian and why? Then you've got to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Yeah. You've got to listen to what they have to say. Because a lot of times they're going to tell you exactly what, they feel, you know, what they've been through. Yeah. Yeah. Let them share with you. Because once again, their, their perspective is valid. And we've got to listen. Sometimes, guys, if we have a listening session, it goes for about an hour, hour and a half. And that's all the time you got. But that's okay. You can study on the next one. But at least you listen to that person. And you, you let them share it. You share it. The person taking notes share it. Hey, amen. You know, usually every study in the kingdom of God studies, you know, the first principle studies about an hour, hour and a half. If your studies are going two and a half hours or more, you're doing them wrong. Either you're talking too much or you're letting them ramble on or something's going on. But your study should take about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. You know, maybe an hour and a half, and a half for a light and dark for the roof. Sinful people like me. You know, maybe that takes you a little bit longer. But guys, when studies are going too long, it's like, oh my goodness. No wonder they won't set up another study with you. They feel like it's a, it's a lecture. <laughs> and Bible studies are times for, for the Word of God to really reveal where we're at. You know, uh, our study should be an hour, very most, hour and 15 minutes, you know. Uh, the other situation you've got to remember is whenever you're doing a Bible study with somebody who's religious, Pentecostal, or, or charismatic background, uh, you're not going to win them with doctrinal arguments. Yeah. You will not win them. You are going to win them through love. Yeah. You are going to win them through spending time with them. Yeah. You are going to win them through the power of the Holy Spirit and discipleship. Yeah. That's how you're going to win them. You, you'll never win them on a doctrinal argument. It might get their attention, yeah. but it'll never win them. Yeah. It's the Word of God and love that will really win them. Amen? Amen. Amen? And we go into all the studies with everybody who's studying the Bible with, regardless of what their background is. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit study obviously is, 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 is different. The miraculous gift study a little bit different. But I heard the Kingdom of God study. Some people were thought it was optional. No. Uh, the Kingdom of God study, guys, everybody does. As a matter of fact, when, it, when you do the Kingdom of God study, you become a Bible scholar. Oh yeah. Because you tie the Old Testament with the New Testament. They're like, whoa! How'd you know so much? And it's just one little study. Don't please, please, please. Don't let it ever be said. The Lou Jack said it's okay to skip the kingdom study. We don't skip the kingdom study. Amen? And why do we do these studies? We do these studies not only to teach and to convey, not information, but convey heart. But we do these so that we're building a relationship with people we reach out to. Relationship is so huge. 75% of people come out to church come because of relationship. It really is. You know, you'll, you'll get the cold contact people as well, but 75% come from relationship. So that just goes to show you how incredibly important that is. Uh, last week, uh, we had an amazing uh, shepherd's meeting, you guys. Yeah. Uh, can, I have, can I have my shepherds? My shepherds in training stand up right now. Come on, can I have my shepherds in training? Look at these. Yeah. These are my shepherds in training right now. Amen. These guys, and they're, they're going to be helping us build the kingdom of God. There's a lot of wisdom right here. Yeah. Yeah. And that, what does that mean? Lou Jay and Kathy aren't the only ones leading this church. Yeah. We're all leading together. We're helping each other out. Yeah. I need these. Guys. They shepherd Kathy and I. Yeah. You know, a lot of times shepherds, uh, sometimes, you know, we look at shepherds as, you know, you need to get behind me, bro. Oh. You know? But we don't do that in the kingdom. Oh. In the kingdom of God, the shepherds advise us. Yeah. I'm asking input from my shepherds because there's a lot of wisdom right here. Yeah. Right. And I need that, you know. I need that love and that support and, and, and that input. I need my, my, I need my marriage disciples sometimes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like we need that, you know. And so these are the people, guys, that are helping us build the kingdom of God. You guys can sit down. Thank you guys so much for your 
Now, if I can also have uh, people who've been disciples for 10 years or more stand on up. People who've been disciples for 10 years or more. He's not even going to be out here. Look around you to people. Now, you see all these people? These two are shepherds. In the sense of they are, they've been around so long. They've, they've gotten so much wisdom from so many different people. These people are, are people that you can really rely on to help you. I mean, I love these guys. Why? They help us build the kingdom. So there's a lot of wisdom. Take a look around, guys. Write your names down. Get their phone numbers. Because when we're not available, they're going to be available. There's a lot of wisdom right The Troubles, the Nelsons, you know, uh, the Goltons, in, 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 you know, you know uh, doing a kingdom, the kids' kingdom, you know what I mean? These are people that you can count on. So you guys, thank you for your faith and your service. I love you. Happy to be here. we got so many people who provide incredible counsel so that we don't have to do this. But do you think Kathy and I are going to evangelize the DMV by ourselves? We're trying to evangelize our own family. <laughs> the DMV by ourselves. No way. We, can, we need your help. That's why we need shepherds, Bible talk leaders. That's why we need ministry leaders as well. Look over at John chapter 3. Come on. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why is it important to read John chapter 3? Look at verse 34. The Bible says here in John chapter 3, verse 34, For the one whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. Jesus Christ had the Spirit of God without limit. In John 3, 34, in the Revised Standard Verse, in the RSV, the Bible says, For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for it is not by measure that he gives the Spirit. Once again, Jesus Christ had the, a full measure of God's Holy Spirit. In the Gideon's Bible, the one we've been re having out reading today, people. It says here in the ESV, for he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Yeah. The whole point. Jesus had the full measure of the Holy Spirit, yeah. and he was never recorded as speaking in tongues. Wow. Never recorded as speaking in tongues. A language he never studied or a language with which he was totally unfamiliar. He never was recorded either in Judeo-Christian history or in the Bible as speaking in tongues. You've got to keep that in mind. John the Baptist. John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit from birth. He was the only one who ever did. He had the Holy Spirit from birth, from birth according to Luke chapter 1, verse 14. And he was never recorded either in secular history or traditional Judeo-Christian history or the Bible as speaking in tongues. Never. Why is this so important? Because so very often in charismatic and Pentecostal circles, the proof that you have the Holy Spirit is your speaking in tongues. That's the proof. You don't, have this, you don't have this gift of tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life. This is what is claimed. How do I know? I've been through it. I, I grew up in, 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 in a, a Calvary Chapel type church in, 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 uh, in L.A. You know, and we would get together and, and, and we would pray and, 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 and people would pray for people to receive the Holy Spirit. You know, when, when that's not what Peter taught. That's not what Jesus taught. It's not what Paul taught. So where do we get it from? If Jesus, Peter, and Paul didn't teach it, where are we getting it from? Because it ain't inspired if it ain't from Peter, Jesus, Peter, or Paul. Can you imagine, too, the culture? Can you imagine, you know, if, if you really believe this, you grew up with your mom, your dad, your grandma, grandpa, everybody, your uncles, aunts, friends, family. Can you imagine the pressure to speak in tongues if you believe this? Whether you really were going to speak in tongues or not, everybody around you, is quote unquote speaking in tongues. Oh, boy, boy. And you're growing up in this. Of course you you have that pressure. Yeah. You really want to do it. You know, you because you, 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 you this is what you grew up with. Yeah. And this is all you know. Yeah. You know? I, I've been in, in circles of people where, you know, somebody would would, 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 would say something, you know, in, in, in a tongue and, and somebody would say, you know, you have, you have a beautiful tongue. <laughs> and they'd be like, thank you very much, praise Jesus. And I was like and I'm saying to myself, because I don't want to be rude, because I don't want to say nothing. <laughs> it, doesn't sound like a, a, it doesn't sound like a language at all. It wasn't intelligible. It, it was just like a, it's like a shandala, shandala, shabala, shabala, and I'm like, it's not a language. That's a song from Animal House. <laughs> Here's the thing, you know. When we were doing this, we were sincere. Yeah, yeah. We really wanted to believe something. We wanted to feel something because we, something was missing in our lives. So the pressure to, to do it was so intense. 
And there was a sincerity. Because like I said, these people are sincere. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I was sincere. But I was sincerely wrong. Yeah. Right. And I didn't find out until I opened the scriptures and, and, and read it and said, oh my gosh. This is, this is, this is wrong. This is off. Now I know why. I tried to tell, they would take, I remember I was in a circle and they get, just let your tongue loose. Somebody like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I went like this, I went like, oh, how <laughs> laugh. But I meant it. I really wanted this to be real. And they do too. They do too. I wanted it to be real. It was like when I was a Catholic and I would shake the hand with the guy, you know, behind me in the pew and I'd go, peace be with you. I meant that. Because I wanted an experience that I wasn't feeling. So whether it was Catholic or Protestant, I wanted, I wanted to feel the Lord in my life. You know, I was sincere, but I was sincerely wrong. Yeah. And that's why this baptism with the Holy Spirit study opened my eyes and helped me understand, oh my God, no wonder, no wonder I was wrong. Because I was doing it according to traditions of men. Yeah, they weren't Catholic traditions, but they were Protestant traditions. They weren't brought around by the Catholic Church, but they were brought around by the Protestant Church. So it wasn't a matter of being a Catholic or a Protestant, was it? Do I want to be a true disciple? Right. Right. Do I want to receive the Holy Spirit according to the Word of God, or do I want to have another religious experience? Wow. See, the difference between a religious experience and true conversion is discipleship of the Word of God. Yeah. Through the discipleship of the Word of God, we, become, we, we learn how to be true Christians. Amen? Amen. Right. And this is the thing that helps us. But once again, what did Satan do? He got the Bible out of our lives. He got the Bible out of our churches. Yeah. He definitely got the Bible and prayer out of our schools. But then he got the Bible out of our churches. How do I know that? The Bible illiteracy of Christian people in the United States is staggering. Yeah. And even those who know the Bible aren't putting it into practice. Yeah. So praise God for the kingdom. Amen. Praise Amen. God that we have each other. That yeah. We can call each other higher and be in each other's lives. Amen. Amen. Three manifestations of the Holy Spirit. According to Bible scholars and theologians who are way smarter than me, and who know the Greek and the Hebrew and Aramaic, there are three different manifestations of God's Holy Spirit recorded in the Scriptures. Number one, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is what all of you who are disciples of Jesus Christ and have been baptized into Christ have. Each one of you has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Okay, what is that according to? It's according to Romans chapter 8, verse 9. If you want to turn there. In Romans 8, verse 9, the Bible says, But you are not in the flesh... You are in the Spirit if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Amen? Amen? That's when we get baptized into Christ. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in us. Amen? Amen. And today, Miss Russell's going to get baptized, and the Holy Spirit's going to dwell in her. You know? It says here, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Okay? And then you have to ask yourself, well, when do you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? It's very simple. When did Peter say you received it? When did Paul say you received it? When did Jesus say you received it? In Acts 2.38, John 3, Galatians 3, 26, 27, those three guys, the three main proponents of Christianity, teach us that when we are born again, when we get our sins washed over that way, we receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 18-20. That's when we receive the indwelling. So all of you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Number two, the second manifestation of the Holy Spirit is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Two occurrences, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. Very specific, unique characteristics. Okay, number one, it was a promise. It was a promise made by Jesus. It was a promise made by the prophets. Okay, it was not a command. It was not a general command. Look over in Acts chapter 1. So when you get this in, amen. In Acts chapter 1, the Bible says, as a matter of fact, it was Jesus actually saying it in verse 4, on one occasion, while Jesus was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift my, the, uh, my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. 
For John, baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. It was a promise. It was a prediction made by Jesus. So you guys got to wait there in Jerusalem. You got to tie it together with Luke chapter uh, 24. Who wrote the book of Luke? Who? Very good. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. Luke. He wrote both of them, okay? In Luke chapter 24. Let's see, if, let's see if Jesus changed his mind. In verse 44, he said, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And check this out, guys. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning where? Jerusalem. At Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with what? Power, Power from on high. Second manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The other thing, it was also predicted. It was predicted in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, that the kingdom of God would come with power. Uh, and, and here's the other thing. Number three, another characteristic of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, it came without warning. Yeah. People were not specifically praying for this, yeah. which is the way I used to believe that that's what we had to do. We got together in groups and we prayed to receive the Holy Spirit speak in tongues. But these people weren't praying for it at all. Yeah. This is just something that happened and it happened in a very, for a very, very important reason. Because people of all nations were there. And they wouldn't have been able to understand just Aramaic, which is what the apostles spoke. Wow. That's all they spoke. When they were in when their religious gatherings, they spoke a little Hebrew, but they spoke to each other in Aramaic. So this is what happened. When they spoke in different languages, it was something incredible. It was something amazing. It was something that only God could do. Yeah. The, fourth, the, the fourth characteristic of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, it was accompanied with actual languages. It was not gibberish. It was not Shabbat ding dong. It was not that. It was, it was real languages that were intelligible by someone in the audience. There had to be someone there to be able to understand what was said. Yeah. Number five, it had a purpose. The purpose was to usher in the kingdom of God with power. Amen? Amen. And you talk about power. Guys, this is amazing. Check this out. Look over in Acts chapter 2. Day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Now they were staying in what city? Jerusalem. There it is. They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from where? Every nation. Every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked him, all those men who are speaking Galileans? Well, then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? <coughs> now, check this out, guys. Parthians. You know what the Parthians spoke? Iranian. Oh, wow. They spoke Iranian. Wow. The Medes. You know what they spoke? Median. <laughs> Old Persian. The Elamites. You know what the Elamites spoke? Elamite. <laughs> it's, a, it's regarded by the vast majority of linguists as a language isolate. As it has no demonstrable relationship to the neighboring Semitic languages, Indo-European languages, or Sumerian. Wow. It is now an extinct language. It doesn't even exist anymore. Wow. But it had to be spoken on the day of Pentecost for the Elamites to understand. On, Residents of Mesopotamia. Do you know what they spoke? Sumerian. They spoke Sumerian. Judea. What did they speak there? Not only Aramaic, but they spoke Hebrew. Okay? Cappadocia. You know what they spoke there? Cappadocian Greek. Pontus, you know what they spoke there? Pontic Greek. Greeks had a lot of different dialects. Okay? Check this out. And Asia. What? They spoke Chinese on the day of Pentecost? You better believe it. Sino Tibetan. Sino Tibetan. Uh, Sino Tibetan language. Indo European. Uh, the Altaic family of languages. The Mon Khmer. Mon Khmer, what is that? Cambodian. Wow. Something that was a, a, a precursor to Cambodian. Wow. Thai Kadai. Austronesian. Dravidian. What in the world is that? Wow. 
Dravidian, I've never heard of that. You know, Afro-Asiatic. Come on. some African up in there. <laughs> Siberian. Like, guys, this was an amazing occurrence from God to usher in the kingdom of God with power. Isn't that amazing? Those are real languages, not gibberish. Not, not, not. They were real languages that were spoken to real people so they could really be saved. Amen. Phrygia. What did they speak? They spoke Phrygian Greek. Pamphylia. Another ancient Greek or Aluic Indo-European language or dialect related to Carian, Lycian, Lydian, and Milian. Okay? Egypt. They spoke Egyptian. Egyptian Arabic. They spoke Coptic. You know? Uh, uh, Libya. They spoke uh, Libyan Arabic. Cyrene. They spoke ancient Greek from Cyrene. Vis visitors from Rome. They spoke Latin, guys. On the day of Pentecost, they spoke Latin. And this is both Jews and Converts, Jews and Cretans. They spoke a language called the Noan. And the Arabs, they spoke a language called Ugaritic, Phoenician. Uh, and it says, you know, we did hear them declaring the waters of God in our own tongues. This was real. That's why it was so powerful. That's why it was so mind-blowing. That's why it was so necessary back in the first century. Amen? You know, God wants us, you know, to understand that, you know what? This happened. It really happened. But once again, it was a prophecy. That was fulfilled. And once a prophecy is fulfilled, it's done. Now you're going to wait for the next prophecy. Why are we still waiting for Jesus to come back? Because it was a prophecy that has not been fulfilled yet. We're waiting for the second coming, right? But we wait and we live in hope. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You know what's amazing is uh, the Corinthian church had a lot of problems. It's not like church today, doesn't it? <laughs> we got a lot of problems in church, you know, here and there. You know, because whenever you have people, you have problems. Yeah, yeah. Praise God, when you've got the Bible, you've got the solutions, amen? amen. But you've got to be willing to put those solutions into practice. In the Corinthian church, they didn't even have the book of Corinth, Corinth to, 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 to bet on. Right? The Corinthian book is like, then it wasn't later on that Paul wrote the thing, and then it was canonized eventually. But, you know, they did have the Old Testament and the wisdom that's found there. That's why, we, that's why we're a Bible church. Yeah. We're not a New Testament church. We're a Bible church because there's so much wisdom in the Old Testament that we still Amen. use. Amen. But they had some amazing challenges in the church in Corinth, just like we have today. You know, and one of those challenges was how the tongues were being misused and abused. Okay? Uh, imagine a church where some had to get the tongues and others did not. Guess what the tongue speakers felt? Almost spiritually. Can you imagine? But how well, do I know? Because that's where we are. Yes. We're the same way they are, you know? Now that, and here's the thing not everyone spoke in tongues. That's a, that's a major finding. How do we know that? Well, because the Bible said some spoke in tongues, some didn't. You know, some had the gifts, some didn't. Because nowadays in the charismatic circles, they teach that everybody speaks in tongues. No, thank you. Wow. At least the ones I was involved, that's what they said. And it was a proof that you had or didn't have the Holy Spirit. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, and this is after that famous chapter on the book of love, uh, on, on, on the concept of love, right? Yeah. What he, they call the most excellent way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says here, follow the way of love, okay, like I talked about in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. So Paul's saying you've got to desire spiritual gifts. This is a good thing. But especially the gift of prophecy, he says. What did he call the way of love? And what, you know, what chapter early he called the most excellent way was love. And then eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. Why? To build yourself up? No, to build up the church. Here's a question I got for all of us today. Are you using your spiritual gifts to build yourself up or the body of Christ? Are you studying the Bible with anybody right now? And if not, why not? All of us got to be concerned. Say, Man, we, we got a lot of lost people out there. Yeah. All of us need to be in a study. If you don't know how to set up a Bible study, talk to your Bible talk leader. He'll help you. But every single one of us disciples should be in a Bible study. Amen? Amen. Get, use your spiritual gifts, you know. It says here, especially the gift of prophecy. Guess what most modern scholars have concluded about this gift of prophecy? It's simply preaching the word. <laughs> Preaching the word of God. 
That's why it was so important. That's why he said, especially preaching the word. You know? According to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Watch how it all comes together to build up the church. Watch this. Verse 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue, in a foreign language, does not speak to men, but to God, the creator of foreign languages. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. You see, a person in the first century may have had the gift of tongues, but only God understands him if he's speaking ancient Phoenician or Chinese or Latin in a church full of Aramaic and Hebrew speakers. In fact, he doesn't even know what he's saying. It says in verse 3, But everyone who prophesies, everyone who preaches the word, in the language of the audience present, speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. We do that today. Amen? Amen. Does that make, is it beginning to make sense now? He who speaks in a tongue or a foreign language edifies himself. It's like, wow, I'm going to forget the tongue. Say that, that builds him up. But he who prophesies, he who preaches the word, edifies what? The church. The church. When you preach the word, you build up the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Verse 5. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. I'd like everybody to speak in foreign languages. Man, I wish some of you could speak Spanish. So we can start our Spanish ministry. Amen? Amen. I know we got a few Spanish speakers, but man, I, I cannot wait to start a Spanish ministry in Washington, D.C. You know? Don't you think Andrew would be fired up if some of us spoke uh, Hausa or Igbo or Yoruba or Rubobo or Ibibio or Ido or Fufude or Kaluri or even Afrikaans? We're getting ready to plant the church in South, in South Africa. Wouldn't it be fired up if some of us spoke Afrikaans? Amen? It would be amazing, you know? But we can't even speak Wakandan up in here, right? <laughs> <laughs> but then he says here, yes. then he says, but I would rather have you prophesy. I would rather have you preach the word than preach on the tongues. <laughs> See, Kip, Andrew, myself, we all would rather have everybody right. preach the word of God. Amen? Amen? And then he says, he who prophesies, who preaches the word, is greater than he one who speaks in tongues. Whoa! The Holy Spirit said, What? He said, man, you preach the word, you're greater than the one speaking in tongues. Why is that so important? Because everybody could preach the word. All of us in this room could preach the word. That's what he was saying. Back then, some had the gift of, uh, of tongue speaking, but they weren't preaching the word. He said, I want you guys all to be preaching the word, amen? He probably says, greater than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Another clue. If you don't have an interpreter or an audience that speaks the foreign language you're speaking, what good is it speaking that foreign language? Yeah. If I broke off in Russian, you'd be like, oh man, he speaks Russian, great. Man. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love our I love our international Sundays, right? Because yeah. we have everybody come on up, we all speak, you know, and we have the people come in and, and, and they and they pray in their language, right? Yeah. And it's beautiful and it's awesome. But you know what? You know, I'm not edified till I understand English, you know? Or, I, mean, I understand Spanish and English, but that's it. As much as I love French, I could just say, Amen, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I hope one of you is friend, right? But I have no idea. You know, it's like, but, 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 but this, the whole concept is that I, I praise God that our French brothers and sisters are going to hear the word of God. But I... I am edified I, when I understand what the word says. Yeah, come on. When, when, it's, when it's my language, when it's my heart language. That's why we have the whole concept of the heart language program in, 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 in the City of Angels Church. They got one now in Spanish, amen. They got one in Tagalog, amen. Wow. For the Filipinos. You know, so hey, listen, man, we got we to do some imitating, amen. Yeah. In verse 6. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? I got to give you some practicals. Not going to do me any good. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the flute or the harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying because he's speaking in a foreign language, I'm a foreigner to the speaker and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. Amen? Amen. It was relevant back in the days of Corinth. It's relevant today. What gifts are you using for the kingdom of God? Are you a great singer? Then why are you not helping us with song service? 
Can you preach the word? Then I need you to come preach the word. This is coming Wednesday in midweek service. The men are going to preach the word. Amen. 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 Come on, whatever your gifts, maybe, you're, maybe you have an incredible gift for fundraising. I need your help. Because we're trying to raise $136,000 for Africa. I need your help to do that. Because I'm lousy at fundraising. Yeah. I hope you can help me out. Amen? Amen. No, but we got to excel in gifts that build up the church, you know? And this is for verse 13. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. Yeah. Why? So he can explain to us what he wants us to do. Because preaching isn't just for preaching's sake. Yeah. I'm not up here just to hear myself talk. Yeah. I hear myself talk every day. <laughs> I'm up here because I'm calling you to do something. Come on, right. What I'm calling you to do is use your gifts. To the glory of God. Yeah. You know, I praise God. Because, uh, you know, I, I can't lift up DJ enough. I love DJ. He uses his gift of bowling. Mm. He's a good bowler. Yeah. Last the other week he threw a 244. Woo. Last week he threw a 234. A 234. Bro. Keith, Keith, been tearing it up too. The other day, Keith, but yeah, I, I was, I bowled a one. Uh, was like, I was like a 188, 189. I was fired up, and I'm, like, oh. and I'm looking at it like, man, I was because I could not catch DJ at 244. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I ain't gonna happen. At least I beat Keith. <laughs> <laughs> so Keith gets up there and, and proceeds to roll a triple. Uh, was it turkey? A turkey in the tenth frame. Wow. He beat me by five pins. <laughs> he threw a 193 to my 188. Oh. But these guys are using their gifts. They, 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 even what they like to do for fun to reach out to other people. Yeah. Reaching out to all them folks in the bowling alley. You know, what are you using for God's kingdom? When is the last time you were in a Bible study? you got to use your gifts so you can share the good news. Amen? Amen. Even if it's in a bowling alley. Amen? Amen. Continues. It says here, uh, verse 13, For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may be interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, a foreign language, my spirit prays through the power of the Holy Spirit. But my mind is unfruitful, because even I don't understand what I'm saying. I'm just a vessel for God's word just to the speakers of a foreign language. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, so if you're praising God in a foreign language via the gift of tongues, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen that you're thanksgiving since he does not know what you're saying? How can a visitor or a fellow disciple say amen when he doesn't understand the foreign language you're speaking? Especially given the fact that you're not interpreting what you're saying. Verse 17, you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. It's awesome that you're giving thanks, but I'm not fired up because I don't know what you're saying. You know, once again, it's like our International Sunday. You know, in verse 18, he goes, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Whoa! Paul's like, I speak in a lot of languages. I don't understand. <laughs> but God uses me. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a foreign tongue, in a foreign language. Instruction, guys. Instruction about obedience, about faith. Not the miraculous manifestation of a foreign tongue, but instruction is what is important. Yeah. Look what he says here in verse 20, guys. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. Stop being childish about these gifts. They're not for you. They're for building up the church. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and continue to mature into Christian adulthood by the constant use of the scriptures and avoiding evil. This is what Paul preaches throughout the Word of God. In verse 21, In the law it is written, Through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, and, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Why did the tongues first come on the day of Pentecost? Because there were nothing but unbelievers there. They believed in God. They believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. But they did not yet believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They did not believe that. So they had to hear this. It had to be something powerful for them to be convinced. Amen? Amen. And we find out that day that 3,000 were added to their number Come that day. On. They were convinced by the miracles, but they were also convinced that the, the, the Old Testament was being fulfilled right. during New Testament times. Right. Amen? Amen? It is an amazing thing what God does yes. you know, through this church. You know? and, 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 and over in Ephesians chapter 4, we'll close out there. In Ephesians chapter 4. Because this is kind of where Paul brings it to a head. But in Ephesians chapter 4, when you get there, say amen. 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 
In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. The Bible says here, there is one body. How many bodies are there? One body. Okay. And one spirit. How many spirits are there? One. That's it. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This was written about 60 to 62 AD. We have to ask ourselves, okay, well, which baptism is this? If there's only one baptism left by 60, 62 AD, which one is it? Three options. Number one, is it John's baptism? No, we find out that John's baptism passed away when the new covenant began, according to Acts 19, verse 1 to 5. Number two, is it the baptism with the Holy Spirit? The one that came with tongues? No. How do we know that? Because there was two occurrences of it. It was a promise that was kept. It was a prophecy that was fulfilled. And once the prophecy fulfilled, that's it. Now you're on to the next prophecy. What's that next prophecy? Jesus coming back. Has that one been fulfilled yet? No, we're waiting for that. But we're working towards that. To take as many as possible. Amen? The other thing is that baptism with the Holy Spirit was never a command for all Christians. But repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that was a command. That was a command from Jesus. That was a command from Peter. It was a command from Paul. Whenever there are questions of doctrine, guys, always go back to those three, the big three. Jesus, Peter, Paul, what did they say? What is it for? What is baptism for? When you begin to understand what baptism is for, according to Jesus, Peter, and Paul, you have your answer. Yeah. And it's so simple, even a third or fourth reader would get it. Amen? Amen. Amen? So what's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because it was a promise that was also already fulfilled. Number three, what's the third option? Baptism with water in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of sins, to prepare your temple to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Come. Was it that baptism? Yes, it was. How do we know? Because it was the only one practiced by the time Ephesians was written. Come. Jesus commanded this baptism, Matthew 28, John 3, Mark 16, 16. This baptism was recorded all the way throughout the book of Acts and the epistles of Paul. In fact, Peter was present for all the baptisms. Wow. Peter was present for John's baptism. That was a requirement to be an apostle. And, and the born-again baptism of Acts 2.38, it had to be the one baptism of Ephesians, Ephesians 4.4-6, uh, 4 because by that time, it was the only one practice. Why is this so important to understand? Because millions of people who claim to be Christians, who claim to speak in tongues or even do miracles, they're not even disciples of Jesus Christ at all. They were just like we were. I don't, I don't look at them as less. I'd say they just were the same as us. Some of us were religious but we weren't righteous. Some of us were religious, but we weren't living right. We didn't even know how, right? And if, if they weren't true disciples, we'd evangelize the world a long time ago. Right. Yeah. Why is this so important to understand? Because there are millions of people who claim to be Christians and do miracles, etc., but they've never baptized a disciple themselves. They've never baptized anybody. How do I know? Because I've baptized several dozen of them. And I've seen several thousand more baptized all around the world who are still faithful disciples making other disciples. There are millions of people who claim to be Christians and speak in tongues and do miracles, but they have no real power to change their own lives. And God said, you know what? You've got to run away from that kind of religion. Uh, look over at 2 Timothy chapter 3. I didn't mean to lie to you, but I need to show you one more scripture. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 3. When you get this, say amen. amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 1. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful, proud, abusive. Disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, 
rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Here it is, guys. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with them. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God gives us these scriptures so that we can know the difference between living in error and living according to the word of God. Does God expect perfection? We'd all be doomed. Because none of us are perfect. But God does expect us to strive daily to be in his word and to be disciples. He expects that. That is something that can be evaluated on the outside. You, nobody knows the heart of a man except God. But we know your heart by what you do or what you don't do. And God wants us all to be his disciples. Amen? Amen. You know what I'm praying to God for right now? I'm, I'm praying to God for some impossible things. And I hope you will too. Come on. Number one, I'm praying for both of my sons to die faithful in the Lord. Amen. And sometimes I look at this situation and I think it's ain't never going to happen. <laughs> But you know what? I look at God and say, man, God can do this. Right. Number two, I pray to lose 45 pounds by the time of the GLC 2018. <laughs> I've been trying to lose 45 pounds for the last 45 months. So obviously, I'm doing something wrong. I need some help. Number three, I pray for the D.C. church to double by the end of the year. I know the man is the choir of the Lord. Because I, you know, sometimes I don't see it by faith. I don't see it by sight, but I see it by faith. Right. Number four, I pray that we raise two hundred seventy-two thousand dollars for missions and pay off all our bad debt. Yeah. We're gonna blow our missions, amen. Yeah. We get out of debt in this church. We get out of debt in this church, amen. Yeah. And, and, and I pray we make a big chunk by May 20th, which is our, our special contribution Sunday. Number five, I pray that we'll be able to regionalize by the end of the year. Right. And we will have a Maryland region with a campus ministry at University of Maryland. I pray that we will have a Virginia region with a campus ministry at George Mason. I pray that we will have a D.C. region with a campus ministry at American University and Howard and even Georgetown. Amen. Are you ready for America, church? Are you ready for a miracle? Well, good, because I hope so, because next week, Jeff Fisher is going to preach on the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you guys for coming.